you have, in fact, I think it's just come up now, you have effectively agreed to that recording. Um, okay, so just to speak a little bit about what is behind this event. Um, UCU has really been one of the organisations leading the way on the need to reimagine how admissions to universities works in the UK. We're a very unusual beast um, in terms of how admissions works across the world in admissions. Um, and we really believe that post-qualification admissions represents a very important opportunity for bringing about changes to make admissions fairer and more transparent for students. But there are obviously different models for how this might go ahead. So we have led the way and opening up the conversations about how it might work. I am really, really delighted to introduce to you our two speakers that we have today. Um, that is Graham Atherton and Lee Elliott Major. So I'm gonna say a little bit about both of them and then I'm gonna give you each up to 10 minutes to speak, um, just kind of whatever you want to, to introduce. And then when we've had those contributions from Graham and then from Lee, we will move to a Q&A session, which as I said, we'll, we'll use the hands up function on Zoom to take those questions. We have had a couple of questions pre-submitted as well, um, which I'll come to. But basically, um, it falls to me to say that in recent years, there has been growing support across the educational system for a shift to post-qualification admissions or PQA for short, which would avoid the current reliance on inaccurate predicted grades and would bring the UK into line with the rest of the world. So the government consulting on potential reforms at the moment, this session is here for us to consider some of the benefits that changing this system would bring, as well as specifically exploring some of the practical considerations facing the post-16 education sector as post-qualification admissions is introduced. So our first speaker is Graham Atherton, um, from Access HE and the National Education Opportunities Network, or NEON uh, for short. Graham has been working in the field of education research and management since 1995. After six years of leading the AIM Higher work in London, he founded and now leads both Access HE and NEON UK in the UK. He's a member of the board of the National Union of Students and holds visiting professorships at Amity University, London and Sunway University, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And um, I'm sure Graham will tell you a bit more about himself when he begins in a moment. Our other guest on the panel today is Lee Elliott Major, who is based at the University of Exeter. He is the country's first professor of social mobility, was formerly the chief executive of the Sutton Trust, and is a founding trustee of the Education Endowment Foundation. And Lee has served on several government advisory bodies and presented several times to the House of Commons Education Select Committee. So thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. I'm first of all going to hand over to Graham. And as I said, you've got up to 10 minutes, Graham, and I will be timing you. So if you see me waving madly at you, that's a sign that it's about a minute left. And then I will stop you at 10 minutes. So whenever you're ready. Thank you, Vicky. So I'm just going to kind of share my screen, hopefully, and uh, where you can see my slides. Uh, I guess um, because this is a um, fairly technical area, uh, I thought it might be a good idea to uh, to make a quick presentation and hopefully run through this pretty quickly. Because, like Vicky says, we need to get to the discussion part of the day. So um, anyway, the, the title is post qualification admissions. How we can how can we do it? So I guess my focus today is is less about the rationale for uh, a change, which I'm sure Lee will talk about, we'll get into in conversation, but also really about if we have a change, how can we implement that? Because one of the big concerns about a change in this area is the practicalities of implementation. Let's give a bit of background where I come to from this. Um, UCU, as Vicky said, has been very involved in uh, the PQA discussion over recent years. Uh, prior to 2018, an excellent piece of work by Jill Wyness looking at predicted grades and inaccuracies, which is one of the, uh, I guess, uh, springboards for the debates on, on change. But uh, we produced actually three pieces of work for UCU, one looking at how it works across the world, which as Vicky alluded to, uh, shows that we are very unique across the world in having our system of pre-application admission, if you like. 
um, uh, and um, then uh, a piece of work which looks to, to have a model, outline a model for what a post-qualification application system could look like, uh, which I'll draw upon a bit today. Then a piece of work in 2020, looking at the views of senior stakeholders. And there's a piece of work coming out next week, which, is, which this uh, presentation uh, talks a little bit about, which will look at how we can actually deliver a post-qualification emissions system. Okay. So what's the case of PQA very briefly? As I said, it doesn't really look at that. I mean, I think for some of us will be familiar with the, the view that uh, predicted grades are inaccurate and incorrect. This may have an impact on widening access. I, I would, you know, maybe draw attention to the third bullet there, perhaps one we talk less about. If we look at research from the uh, HEPI, the Higher Education Policy Institute, and their academic experience survey, we found that actually a significant percentage of students are unhappy with their course and institution. And this percentage actually increases from all students at 36% to uh, over half of the students who enter via clearing. So I guess if you think about the case for PQA, it's in three different levels, really. I guess the incorrection of predicted grades and that's implication for students entering HE, the impact on level three students uh, of uh, unconditional offers and also predicted grades and that the burden upon teachers and others, and then possibly the impact on graduate outcomes and student experience. So I guess there's a threefold case of PQA in my view. Uh, and, and I think I share UCU's view, there is a case for changing the emission system to post qualifications application system. But in order to do so, uh, there has to be significant changes made to emission system overall. This briefly here on the third slide is the two models offered in the government's consultation. As most of you will know, the reason we're here, I guess, is the government has, has taken on the mantle, really, of thinking about emissions change. And uh, earlier in the year, uh, launched a consultation uh, around uh, changes to the education emission system. That consultation closes in the middle of May. And in that consultation, they offer two particular models, post-qualifications application and post-qualifications offers. With post-qualifications application, uh, what we see is students actually applying to education after they receive their examination results. In post qualifications offers, students will apply before they undertake their examinations, but receive offers after they receive their results. So the offers happen in August in post qualifications offers. The applications happens in the August time in a post qualifications application. Uh, so there's the two off really models the government offered. The government's obviously keen to hear views around how these models could work. Uh, and I think this is where we come in, really, in the report that I'm presently doing for UCU, try to really add particularly some depth to our post qualifications applications model could work. Here uh, is, is, this is taken from the 2019 paper, which I produced uh, with Angela Narty from UCU, which looked at how a post qualifications application model could work. And one of the key features uh, of this model is thinking more about choice and how students make choices regarding higher education admission. Choice is a process that for many students begins very early, uh, often so some in primary school. Recent research by UCAS suggested that a third of students have started thinking about education progression in primary school. And it happens through, uh, for young learners and for older learners, of course, through the, through the life course for older learners, and for younger learners through uh, their educational careers through schooling. In order to recognise that, therefore, in the model, uh, the student-centred post qualifications application model, which uh, Angela and I developed uh, together uh, in the 2019 paper, then what we see there is a much greater emphasis on supporting choice making earlier as part of the admission system change, but also considering closely how we support uh, choice making in a more systematic way through and up to the receiving of examination results uh, in the August time. And as we'll see in a moment, one of the key issues regarding practicalities of post qualifications applications models is how we will be able to deliver certain aspects of the system with when students uh, only actually apply in August. And also how students can be adequately supported up to and through that period to make effective choices. 
remembering when in the August time such students will no longer be, of course, in school or college, younger students, but will be, of course, well, either working or, or whatever they may be doing over that sort of period. So it's a fundamental, therefore, that in our view, any model does take these things and address them. These are real issues, real concerns, and you cannot deliver an effective post qualification application system unless you're able to recognize how choices made over time, and new strength from particular elements of the system. I'll go on to that now. We divide, uh, therefore, admissions into three phases supporting choice from year 10 up to when results are announced, being learned, application and decision making, uh, which is from August, end of September, and entry into HE. Now, explicit here in the focus primarily on younger learners. And there's a separate debate again about the applications uh, for mature students and older students as they go through the system. And I'm sure we can pick that up in questions as well. And that's picked up in the broader report, which will emerge next week. But the focus here is for younger learners only because uh, large numbers of young learners obviously go through the system. So key in supporting choice is strengthening information advice and guidance. Uh, and it's my view that actually we should be seeing post qualifications application and ambition reform change as a window opportunity to support strengthening information advice and guidance in many across educational sectors, by education, schools, colleges, careers, communities, those working in the fields have called for for many years. The question is, will that happen under this administration? And that's something we can get onto in questions, I'm sure, as well. I won't go into all the different elements there, you can see in the full report, but strengthening IAG is one of, the, one of the key issues. Particularly important in supporting choice is an expression of interest phase. We argue in our model, there should be an expression of interest phase, where students can express interest in up to five courses in January of the entry year. There's not an application, it's an expression of interest via UCAS. The huge advantages of building into the system the systematic point of recognition of choice for learners is laid out there, particularly completion of the application form. One of the big concerns of the school and, school and college community is if students are left to do the whole form on their own in August, certain students won't do it or will find elements of it difficult. That can be addressed by allowing certain bits to be completely alone in the system. It all has information for universities, HEIs as well, to understand future course demand and to start engaging with students which turn to their institutions in particular ways, which we're going to later on in questions. We also, in the report next week, tackle it for the issue of interviews. One of the big questions here is how do we deal, particularly with either courses where demand outstrips supply, and therefore HEIs wish they wish to interview, Courses where interview or audition are essential, audition is essential as part of the admission process. Or courses where, again, interview is seen as a very important aspect in ensuring fit, particularly professionally or orientated vocational courses, where not just courses are taken, but there's a certain career pathway, which believe we have to affinity to. My argument in the report next week is a number of options under what we call the student centre model to address these issues. I won't go into all of them, we can talk about questions as well, but there are particular options, particularly if we can find ways of allowing HEIs to filter students to enable interview to occur prior to application in August time. Sorry about that. Uh, oops. Um, but there are particular options available here, particularly to say if we can find ways of filtering. One of the key issues is filtering students down to interview. The way this may involve actually greater admission tests or may indeed involve uh, discussions earlier about possibly campaigning for reintroduction of things like the AS level, which I know many in the education community are sad to see abolished by the government uh, earlier in the 2010s. A application decision making phase, crucial, I think crucial part of this is we must recognise that students need to be supported at this time. Things like uh, application form completion so, uh, part application or completion early in the year will help here, but it must be recognised that additional burdens must be minimised. How about that big here? I didn't see what you put up there too, brilliant, okay. Additional burdens to school and college staff must be minimised. So we're talking in the report about a number of ways we can look at that, particularly as well, personalised individual support, and also reorientating some of the efforts put into clearing to think about supporting potential students in different ways through that period. 
Finally, uh, final phase, entry into HE. A lot of debate here about when an academic year can start, but the key parts of the earlier uh, model, which brought intense debate, was starting the academic year later. We did not, by the way, argue for a start in January. Uh, that has come into the debate, but it wasn't us who started that. I said didn't start that. However, if we look at the report, we have done some research looking at the start of the academic year and modeled some of this out. It is possible to start late October and finish mid-June and still cover all the elements of semester one and two. We are sensitive to this issue. It's very important in this that we don't just start thinking about any kind of a later start, leaving automatically to a much later finish the academic year, the implications that has to students for academics and their workload and their research opportunities. So we're very sensitive to that in the model. I know that we need to finish now. Finally, as well, the particular groups of students and to be mindful in this debate. Particularly, it comes to entering and starting the year. Students, professional, statutory, and regulatory bodies related courses sometimes have to have a particular amount of learning time. Therefore, their start year has to be a particular point. Students are granted uh, DBS checks. We have to consider how that can be managed, which can take time and just cover quite a, a significant number of students. International students as well, where they fit in this process. And students grant additional support prior to HE entry, such as, for instance, disabled students who often need to engage, want to engage with provider earlier on to ensure that their elements are in place to support their learning. These are issues which are engaged more thoroughly in the report released next week. But they are ones that indeed we must ensure are engaged thoroughly with before we will move to any post qualification applications or indeed post qualifications offer system. Okay, I think that is mainly it. So finally, we do argue in the report a model is feasible, but the models offered in the government consultation need to be developed. Additional investment in IOG is essential. We must consult and engage with all the relevant stakeholder groups, both in academia, schools and colleges, and fundamentally, of course, as well, students themselves. Thank you, Vicky. Thanks very much, Graham. Um, share and... now. I'll try and share some of Stop share. Otherwise, what we have to see what Lee's doing. It's, a, it's my great pleasure now to hand over to Lee. And similarly, Lee, I'm going to give you 10 minutes, but I mean, I'll, I'll pop up and, and wave at you when you've got a couple of minutes left. Um, so whenever you're ready, please begin. Thanks, Vicky, very much. Um, so I'm just going to really uh, make the case for uh, post-qualification uh, application. It's, it's great to have Graham with much more technical expertise on, on this uh, than me. Um, I think what I'd first say is, you know, PQA isn't some uh, panacea that's going to solve uh, all the issues of inequality or social mobility, right? It's, you know, we'd have to fund schools properly to do that. We'd have to address societal inequalities. I know this debate isn't about those wider issues, but I think sometimes there are overclaims in terms of how we reform our, our admissions uh, service, but um, our admission system. But I do think uh, PQA can help uh, in a number of ways. And I think the time is right now. Uh, and, that, and that's because the great UCU report uh, a couple of years ago, the government backing it, a number of universities said they're backing it, schools seem to be supporting it. And of course, we've got huge upheaval in the education system at the moment. So I think the time uh, to change is now. And I'm so glad to, to hear from Graham that, that, that it is feasible because often I get pushed back on, on, on that. Um, you know, I've been a campaigner on this issue for uh, at least 25 years. I think Graham's been around as long as me. And, and I remember talking about this uh, when the Deering Report came out in 1997. Uh, it's, it's often been defeated in my view because of vested interests in the sector a huge sort of inertia in the sector to, to change. So I'm a big supporter. And why do I support it? Well, there's a number of reasons. Uh, Graham touched on some of these, um, and this was in the UCU report as well, of course. The, the, the main problem, or one of the big problems with uh, the current system is that it's wrong most of the time. So about 84% uh, uh, of, of predicted grades are, are actually inaccurate. Um, now, the thing about that is that study, of course, was relating to some years ago, and I've seen other evidence uh, that suggests it's, get, it's becoming even less accurate as the years uh, go by. And um, I, as a school governor at a few different schools, I'm picking up a lot of um, uh, scepticism from teachers in terms of how you uh, 
uh, assess and predict grades now because of the inflation we've seen uh, over the last two two years. So I think we're going to see um, when studies are done in a few years time to look at what's happening now, I suspect we'll see even more uh, inaccuracy in, in how the current system uh, works. And remember, uh, the system we're going to have probably over the next 10 years is going to move to one in which demand outstrips supply. So at the moment, uh, you know, we, we, we have lots of university places for uh, all, all the students applying. I, I suspect, uh, and although I might disagree with some of the policies around this, I suspect that university numbers will be capped. And of course, the numbers of 18 year olds and, uh, are going up uh, every year. So, so the dynamics going to change over the next few years. Um, and I think that makes it even a stronger argument that we need to simplify the admissions uh, system. Um, we, we have, and I think because we're all in the system uh, and many of us are very academically orientated, we kind of enjoy complexity. You know, we add extra things to how we, how we select uh, pupils. And I just think we don't realize how bafflingly complex the admission system is uh, in terms of all the, not just the A-levels a, a or our equivalent qualifications you need, the bespoke admission test, the personal statement. And I just think that having something where you actually apply with your grades would just bring that greater simplicity. And that's particularly important for young people who can't navigate the higher education system, who don't have the parents who also went to university. So I think for that reason, it's, it's a very uh, positive thing for social mobility. The other thing we know, of course, again, from the UCU report is that a, a number of higher achieving uh, disadvantaged young people in terms of their A-levels uh, were underpredicted to compare compared to what they actually got in the end. So, so even though those are relatively small numbers, I still think they're important. Um, and so, you know, a system where you apply with grades would 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 cancel that that um, inequity uh, uh, as well. I also think um, that schools, in many ways. Uh, should focus on what they can do well, which is raising attainment, teaching uh, pupils. And if we had a expert like Graham and others to develop a, a, a PQA, um, my hope would be that schools could then focus more on the part, what they do in the classroom very well uh, it, through the school year. Again, that, that might be challenges to that. I don't know, it might make it even more complicated, but I have to hope that we would, we would find ways of, of, of making that happen. The, the other thing I would say is that post qualifications applications for me is, is what I would call a gateway reform. It paths the way to other potential reforms. So if I had my way, I'd be far more radical, of course. Um, I would have probably a sort of threshold system where, um, you know, you, 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 you took in uh, pupils who were over a certain, so let's call it A levels, uh, say, say you needed three Bs to get to university. And then I would look at those people, those, those pupils with three Bs, and I'd use other criteria to enrol, because my view is that they're all academically able and have potential to, to, to prosper in, in that, that university. Now, I personally would look at radical options like randomising uh, that, that cohort so we get a fair balanced intake, or looking at the social backgrounds uh, of those candidates. So all sorts of things. Now, the, the, only, the only way you can get to do those more radical reforms is if you have a system where you actually have those, those grades to begin with. So, so I would hope we could have wider discussions about making it even more radical, because remember, at the moment, uh, whether you look at universities as a whole or you look at the very highly selective universities, our system is highly skewed to the, the very privileged. So, um, and that hasn't changed really that much in the 30 years I've been campaigning actually for uh, PQA. So, if it, and, and of course, a lot of that is driven by uh, inequalities outside the school system and, and within the schooling system. Uh, but I do think the current admission, admission system is alienating to many uh, children from poor backgrounds. And then lastly, uh, I think, and, and, and Graham did touch on this, you know, the thing that's really convinced me um, uh, re recently is surveys that we have done on the students themselves. So we've done a number of surveys other organisations have as well. And, and what we find is, is that students or potential students are overwhelmingly in support of, of this reform. And I think for too long, we've ignored actually the voice 
uh, of, of those young people. And I think it's time uh, to, to, to support what, the, what they want as well. So in, in summation, um, for many reasons, I support the post-qualification application. I know there's lots of issues around feasibility. I really hope and dream that, that this time we can get it through and it won't be defeated. And I think because we're at such a point in our, in our society where we're looking and, and my research is showing that there are even deeper inequalities that we're all going to face uh, in the post-pandemic world, I hope that we have uh, the, the wherewithal and, and the initiative to take on some of these, these radical reforms, starting with, with PQA. So thank you very much, Vicky. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. Um, I didn't even have to press my alarm, so I will just press that now so that we don't get some beeping. Um, so um, it was fantastic to hear both of your presentations. Thank you very much. Um, as I noted, we do have a couple of questions that came in in advance. So I think what I will try and do is uh, start with those and give people who are in the meeting an opportunity to use the raise hand function if there is a question you would like to add into the mix. And please do stick your hand up if you've got anything at all that you would like to ask. Um, so the first question that we had through um, is how effective will these changes be in tackling the underrepresentation of certain groups in society if we don't remove human judgments from the process? How will it work? So I don't know which, and maybe Lee, you would like a breather as you've just presented, and maybe Graham, it would make sense for you to tackle that question first. Sure, Vicky. Sure. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, I think, you know, first point is, I mean, like, I agree a lot with what Lee said. Uh, in, in really all his points, essentially, um, and particularly his point about you know widening access. I mean, obviously, my key main role has been over the past twenty odd years is campaigning and advocate working on widening access. So uh, I think, as Lee said, this will be an assistance, but not a panacea. I think as Lee pointed out, uh, particularly in this question, this is one that actually I really started to think about in developing this report for next week. In the sense that um, when we talk about contextualised ambitions, uh, there's been a lot of debate on contextualised ambitions as part of, not just part of this reform, I mean, it's something that's been developing for a while, but I remember when we talk about this PQA reform, people have been speaking about other aspects of the system, and I agree with that, because it's not just about shifting you know, application dates around. One aspect that's been discussed a lot is in improving the contextualised ambitions context. However, I think what the questioner is getting at, and something I, I think it actually think is a really good question, is when we start thinking about conceptualized admissions, we, we think about grades, and we think about okay, let's take factor in grades and offer you know particular grade offers to those particular groupings. However, the problem is twofold. Firstly, there's a little bit of lack of transparency in all, in the sense that the student doesn't actually know the percentage or weighting that is attached to various elements of the admission process. So at the moment, your personal statement you have grades, you have reference, and particularly you may have interview or audition or additional form of test that can be a written thing as well in some context. The student doesn't know the content, how much, that, how much the, the weight of all those things. But of those things, we talk about conceptualizing one bit of them, i.e. Uh, explicitly, i.e. Uh, grades. Contextualizing an, an interview in the same objective way is much more difficult. So you might argue in a fairly radical sense, if you're really serious about contextualised admissions, because we know about interviews, you know, we know the voluminous evidence that interview, the interviews are to an extent can be uh, skewed against certain groups. Now, that is not because of the interviewers or, or how, how committed they are. We know that there's forms of unconscious bias in interviews is well documented, except the difficulties in this area. So it's a, a, an argument, say, to, and I play this for a little bit in next week's report, if you're really serious about contextualised ambitions, you might want to think about uh, not having interviews because you can't contextualise them. You can contextualise things that, that don't involve that human judgment as, as the question you're with, I think, driving at. Uh, and I can, I'm not necessarily in the report advocating that, and we don't, but I do, what I do advocate is that as part of this, and I think what I agree with Lee as well, and I think I, we said the same thing in, in, in one particular respect, is I think both of us think, that what you see is almost like at least as a gateway reform. And I use the phrase window opportunity. I think we mean the same thing, i.e. that when we're looking at this ambition reform, it should be an opportunity to really look at more broader aspects of, of, of what we're doing and meeting students. 
I think particularly contextualization of a mission is one of them, and therefore we need to bring interviews into that debate. That's why I think we should be doing. It's not part of that debate. In the moment, the debate is let's look at how we can have a uniform approach to contextualize ambitions for grades across the country so that students know what the approach is. At the moment, it's very different. One university may have a contextualized approach, one may not. One goes on polo, or, you know, geographical postcode, one goes on school. Confused, as Lee said, very confusing for the student. I agree with all that, but maybe let's bring into that debate as well. The role of interviews within that and, the, and also the weighting of various parts of the admissions portfolio so okay you know statements reference uh, uh, where do they fit with all this you can do grades but is that the only thing that makes a difference i wanted to leave now thanks lee can we take your answer to that question now yeah it's a great question um i mean i'm involved in work uh looking at schools as well as universities on this and and you know, I'm a huge supporter, of course, of, of teachers, and I think they did an amazing job and haven't been given a pay increase they should have been this year, by the way. Um, and obviously there's a huge debate about uh, cognitive bias in current assessments this year, right? Um, and I find it quite uncomfortable in a way, because but I think we're all prone to cognitive bias. And what the evidence suggests is that uh, teachers um, unwittingly will mark down those pupils from poorer backgrounds on average. They would get lower grades, the research suggests, than they would do otherwise if they did exams, right? And now, I, I find it difficult because I also have concerns about the exam system in that I think it's there's too much teaching to the set test now in schools. And um, there's so much private tutoring outside schools that examinations have become, to some extent, a, an indication of privilege rather than academic potential in my view I, I think increasingly your a-level grades are, are are a signal of how much support you've got as opposed to what your academic uh, potential is so so like graham I'm, I'm a big supporter of contextual admissions for that reason because i think we have a grotesquely un, unequal uh, playing field in, in education um but it, it is interesting because i go I, I can argue this both ways in many ways because one of the reasons why in one of my books we proposed randomization. So this was the idea that if you get young people with certain grades, there's a sort of threshold uh, that you would have. So I mentioned it earlier. So, you know, let's just call it three Bs. If you got three Bs, you would get into University X. And then uh, one of our suggestions was the fairest way actually of allocating places i know this probably would never work because the uh, people wouldn't go for it would be to randomly allocate to that university and you would probably guarantee those young people to go to university y or z if they didn't get in um and the reason we suggested that was because when you look at all the evidence and this is what i guess what the question is driving at we all suffer from cognitive bias and i and i i don't know graham might know but i haven't seen much research in terms of university decisions in admissions, but I'm convinced that there will be just as much cognitive bias in terms of, of, of the decisions that are made, particularly interviews. Um, so, so that's why we, we suggested that. I mean, I think the more I thought about this, because I suspect that's a reform too far um, for many people, is I do think we need human judgment, but uh, for me, it has to be uh, a more, as, as Graham was saying, a more transparent use of contextual uh, information so that we have clear offers. I think the Scottish institutions have done really well um, in recent years. You know, if you go to a, a university website in Scotland, you will see what the lower offer will be if you meet certain criteria. It's much clearer than many of the institutions down south. I actually think we need to be more radical with those um, lower grade offers. I think we could do more there. And I think universities, um, should actually do should offer more pastoral support they're going to have to by the way in the next couple of years so you know a lot of people push back on me on that saying um you know you shouldn't bring in people with 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 lower grades my view is we probably don't do enough when they when they come on campus or whatever uh, to support them some institutions are better than others at that so so I, th I think you have to have some human judgment for that for that reason um, but, you know, uh, you, you just have to watch and, and try and do the best you can, um, because I, I suspect that moving to the, my more radical options of randomization um, is probably not going to be voted in by this government, I suspect. So, um, but that will be my response. 
Thanks very much, Lee. I'm just going to remind everyone that if you do have questions, please do put your hands up um, and we will bring you in. Um, I do, however, have a question that follows on very nicely from some of the points that um, both Lee and Graham have just made in terms of your answer to that question, but also picking up on this point that you've both re-emphasised, that post-qualification admissions would not be a panacea. It leads us into a question around the need not to throw away the, the baby with the bathwater, um, for want of a better expression. As reform goes forward, how do we protect what is already working, what is good in terms of widening participation and contextual admissions? And I think there's a related question there that we'll, we'll come on to shortly about capacity and funding. But I would just be interested um, in what your views are on that. So I'll go to Graham next on that question. How do we keep what's good and what is working as we move into a, a reform situation? I think it's very important in, in, to do that is to identify what we believe is working. What are the aspects of, of the system that we believe are being effective? I mean, Again, there's a couple of different things here. You know, we're talking about aspects of the ambition system that we believe are effective. So, you know, we have a centralised ambition system, for instance, in UCAS. And it's well respected across the world. And it plays a bit of an organisation. It does allow a lot of people to, to, to progress to higher education. Um, and, you know, there are advantages to students thinking about higher education before they apply, which I think is a lot of what the, the, the papers we produce look at. From widening participation's point of view, then again, I mean, I think particularly what we should see here, this should be uh, an argument for the kind of national collaborative outreach project, which is uh, by really connected at the moment, or has had earlier iterations going back to the 2000s, uh, five different iterations of such projects have been in existence since I began all this in, in, in really much for me in 2000. So, um, I, I think certainly what you're seeing here is opportunity, and this is what we do in the report next week, to de demonstrate, I think, the need for such projects. Because my argument would be, if you are going to have a post qualifications application system, then you are going to genuinely try and improve the choice making that students can make to enter HE. They need support, and the students of wide and access backgrounds need support. Therefore, you do need to support financially for investment, uni connect initiatives, and also indeed um, to ensure that, through, that there's, a, there's a, a strong link between the APP work that universities do and progression through to admission. So I, I think actually, you know, what you should see is opportunity to strengthen wine and access work uh, in my view. And, and that's again, is for me where, where I come into this, this debate. Uh, and I think it, it, where I think we would be a bad case if, is if we had, and I've said this in reports, if we implemented um, such reforms without the scaffolding to support students. So there, is, there is a kind of like in a real worst case scenario somewhere in all this as well. We have to be mindful of if that's what happens. Thanks, Graham. Could I come to you, Lee, on this question then, please? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I mean, my hope would be that, that PQA is, is just the start of wider discussions as we, we keep coming back to. You know, my belief is that all higher education institutions should be social mobility institutions. And what do I mean by that? I, I, by the way, I mean that that covers both staff and students. You know, I don't think we do enough in terms of diversity at the top of, of institutions as well. You know, if, if you're serious about social mobility, in my view, it, it has to be part, part of the culture. Again, some institutions are better at this than others, right? Um, because I, I find some universities I visit that you, you've got almost different cultures. You've got a student culture and you've got the staffing culture. And I think you get, you get sort of clashes there. So I think we have, if we're serious about social mobility and inequality, it has to be a, a sort of central part of, of universities. And I think, by the way, all universities are going to be up against it if they don't move on this agenda. And, I, I, you know, whether it's fair or unfair, because I think actually, if you don't address inequalities in wider society, it's very hard for schools and universities to address all these issues. But I think we're going to come under more scrutiny as a sector in terms of our progress, in, in, in terms of access, uh, in terms of all sorts of background, actually, social class, income, ethnicity, gender, etc. So, so I think 
you know, I, in my hope, my dream would be that this would this wouldn't deter from, from us thinking about those wider issues. I think in terms of admissions, um, you know, I, 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 for me, and Graham sort of hinted at this, I, I think we need more secure long term funding for widening access programs that work. So if we if you go to a PQA, um, then I agree you need more informed choice. Part of that, of course, is the widening at participation activities. I think I think you know for me they've been underfunded and not and, and funded in short term ways for too long. I do think we need to demonstrate through evidence and evaluations what works best so that we can report back to whoever it is in terms of the government or whoever so we we can we, and we probably don't do as good a job there a, a, as we could do but you know if we're serious about these issues um i think you know it's a scandal that we we don't fund further education colleges properly uh you know uh you know i would i would probably look at that as well i'd probably have a pupil premium for disadvantaged people in in, in further education colleges but i would also and I think we'd have to obviously justify this. Think about you know those activities that that, that that the higher education sector already does that is that have been successful for many years, and then of course how we support young people when they go to university. Um, you know I, I am concerned that a lot of uh, young people may in the future years um, I don't like the term drop out, but you know stop their studies, and I, I think we're going to see this more. There's a kind of wave of inequality coming through the system. You know, my research is showing um, that that learning loss in schools has been stark as we as we'd all suspect over the last year. But it's very socioeconomically graded. So it's basically all but the the richest kids are going to are going to have suffered uh, at learning loss and issues around well being. So I think we probably. And, and I'd be interested in Graham's views on this, but I think we know less about what is effective when when we when we have the students there. There's a tendency, isn't there, to focus on access and not success. Um, so that's a long answer, but I, I do, you know, I hope we we don't lose sight of these bigger issues um, if PQA is successful. There's there's lots more to look at. Thank you so much. I'm I'm really excited to report we have two live hands that have gone up with questions now as well. So um, I'm going to go to those next. Um, although those issues you've just raised, if, if they're not covered by the next couple of questions, I'm hoping we might be able to finish um, with a final question around those. Could I ask Chloe Wallace to ask your question, please? Yep. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm kind of curious. I mean, I suppose it's related a little bit related to what's just been said, but I'm curious about how this interacts with the issue of kind of the hierarchy of universities in, in the UK and whether PQA can be used um, as a way to sort of challenge that. I mean, I was an admission tutor in the law school at Leeds University for a number of years. And honestly, half our job was done in terms of recruitment by having a 3A offer because it was seen as a sign of prestige. And then of course the Russell Group thing where you'd be talking to parents and they'd say, you know, the school tells us we ought to put in applications to Russell Group universities, but I don't know what that a Russell Group is. And that was incredibly common. Um, and, and actually the university would refuse to allow us to reduce our grade, our grade requirement. You know, it was, it was almost impossible. And some of that is league tables, which is a whole other thing. But it was also just this idea that a three A's offer is the prestige option. Um, and I think it really harms student choice um, because they're not really thinking about the nature of the program, the place, that sort of thing. Um, I also think it's an issue for access beyond university when you've got, for example, a legal profession and other professions who only recruit from quote top tier universities. So, you know, if you're if you're focusing on widening access into those top tier universities, you still got a finite number of people who can then move into different parts of you know professional and careers activity. And I'm wondering whether there's you know whether PQA has a relationship with that, whether it's neutral or whether there are ways in which it could be done which might actually help get rid of that or not, or you know, limit the impact of that hierarchy on the kind of outcomes for, for people, uh, for students that we're looking for. Thanks very much. 
Thanks, Chloe. Could I ask Lee to come to that question first and then Graham, and then I'm hoping that we will have time to get in a further question just before we finish. Yeah, thanks, Chloe, for that. Um, it is an issue, I think, the hierarchy, uh, which, which I think is more around almost social class than actual academic uh, standards in a way, isn't it? It's, it's you know, because you're back to my point that those a grades are probably a sign more of how much how, how much support those young people have got as opposed to their pure academic potential whatever however defined um i, I hope you know it would the pqa could help in terms of what graham was talking about the wider choice reform and i think it has to be part of that i'm not sure on its own individually it would lead to uh, challenging some of those issues um that you talked about but i would hope if you had grades we would have a better informed choice system. And, and also, um, I think we should have, this is a separate issue, it's a league table. I think we should have social mobility rankings for our universities. You know, we, we measure them basically on how posh people are going in, essentially. That's, that's what we do. Uh, we don't really measure them on their value added. And we don't measure them in terms of their commitment to social mobility. So I know that's another debate. Uh, on, on employers, it's really interesting you say that. I think some employers are sort of stuck in that world in terms of using very crude proxies for talent, which essentially are, again, proxies for privilege. But it's interesting. I do lots of debates with big employers now, and I think in many ways they are ahead of universities in terms of really thinking about how they um, quantify talent. It's very difficult, but they are, you know, they're talking about uh, blind admissions where you don't have the university of the of the candidate um, uh, applying um, and and really thinking hard about contextual data so yeah i think some it depends what in the law maybe area it might be but I, I i've been really impressed with some of the employers thinking about these issues now whether pqa will help that i don't know but they are they're they're, they're very interesting issues Thank you. Can I go straight over to Graham on this question then, if you've got anything to add to? Yeah, yeah thanks, Paul. I think it's a really good question. I mean, I, I, actually, you know, one of the problems, practical problems with PQA compared to other countries is related to this hierarchy issue because in relation to many other countries, you have a very hierarchical higher education system. What that for means is that you do get lots of people applying for particular courses like the one you're talking about and then the problem presented to us is, well, you've got all these people who want to apply, there is some way of filtering them down. We can't filter them down very well because the A-level isn't very, often isn't very subtle as a marker. You know, it's, you, know, you, you don't have a subtle grading system. Therefore, we need to interview them. Therefore, we can't have PQA. That's how the argument kind of runs the logic chain, um, which I've tried to rail against in the paper a bit. Um, I guess how do you re re combat that? There's a broader set of issues of PQA for sure, but your question is good. We know the broader set of issues exist. We know that, let's set them aside. How can PQA come into that? We don't want it to make this situation any worse. You know, it's like it's not can't be a panacea for access. Can it make it any better? I guess the only way it can do that is, is by being part of, a, of the choice, improving choices for students, improving knowledge and transparency for students. It has to be part of this broader window opportunity to improve the information advice and guidance students get to try and therefore move the heat from the system somehow to try and remove the, the, the idea that to be a successful student, one has to apply to this particular course that you're talking about, this leading to too many applications, this leading to that problem. That's the only way to remove that kind of pressure from the system. Uh, therefore, to do that, it has to be part of, of the argue, I guess, this broader idea of improving the, the choices, the, cho the way that students make choices through information about and guidance being improved in a systematic way. I haven't got time to talk about it now. One of the things, for instance, that we suggest in the report is something called study choice check. They have in the Netherlands, where in the Netherlands, each student, as a mandatory thing, has to take a questionnaire about the course they're going to apply to before they do the course. It's not, if you fail or pass it, a, a deal breaker for getting in. It's not about the content. It's about the match between you and the course. It's trying to work out whether you, as a student, will fit with that course. Or not. It's not how much you know about the law. It's this is what's going to be like. This is what's going to happen at the end. This is the student, this is what you bring to it. The reason they do that in Holland is because of a big dropout problem, less than be much bigger than we have here. They're worried about students dropping out. But I really think it's, a, it's an interesting idea because while we don't have a dropout, we do have a dropout issue, but nothing like we do in Western Europe, but it could help us with students understanding really is it for them or not? 
and therefore to help them think about where other places could be for them and take the heat out of the problem that you're you, you lived with probably i hope that's helpful thank you very much both of you um I'm, i don't know if you still have a question michael but michael larkin you had your hand up previously and it went back down again um do you have something you'd like to ask oh i thought it was still up <laughs> it didn't go up straight away yeah i have um just one observation that hasn't really been discussed here really is here in scotland people do their hires a year earlier and they, they get acceptance to university on the basis of that. The same is also true in Ireland with leaving certificate, many students get. So I just wanted to make that observation. But in the middle of it, Lee picked up on something that I'm really concerned about at the moment, and that is supporting students after they get to university. The big surprise this year for me has been students have not dropped out in numbers and I put an FOI into the student loan company and they haven't been trying to defer or suspend their studies either. The numbers have held up. And I've spent some of this today looking at ONS data for employment of students. And there hasn't been a huge collapse. There has been a decline, but there hasn't been a huge collapse in the number of students in part-time work, despite the pandemic. It's absolutely shocking. And I'm picking up on what Rachel Hall put in The Guardian on Sunday about the number of students seeking to defer till next year now because they're panicking about the exams. Now, I've taught for 37 years and panic in exams is not normal at this time of year. I think we've got a, a problem arising where these students were not prepared. And Lee picked up on that as well, that whatever you do with PQA, it's not necessarily going to solve the problem. I think we've had students running around in part time jobs, not studying. Now, the other point that Lee made, I want to add as well and ask what he thinks about it, is that 60 odd percent of students never have a job in the summer or part time, according to ONS data. So it's only a minority of students that are, are struggling with this extra burden. And quite rightly so, they, they may well have not even been prepared before entering the university, particularly last summer. So I wonder really whether we can roll that into the argument about PQA, about A, selecting them a bit earlier and B, giving them more support when they get there. Thank you, Michael. That's a really insightful set of questions. I wonder, I don't know whether, Graham, would you like to tackle that one um, first and then we'll go to Lee? Yeah, thank you, Michael. I mean, I think on your first points about different systems, I mean, again, the paper that we, we, I did um, a few years ago looked at different systems, I think Scotland's very interesting. Uh, because um, in a sense, you, you do, the hires are interesting because of course you can apply, as you say, you know, when you've, uh, when you've taken your hires and, and then taking it afterwards. It's a very interesting system, Scotland. I don't think we're looking at Scotland enough in this context. When you brought a question about support when students enter, again, I think that's interesting as well for an international context because I've done recent work a few years ago looking at European systems. And we try to think in that research project about admission not finishing when the student just starts on day one. Admission being something that continues into year one, because that is part of admitting the student. You know, you just admit the student and leave them to, to get on with what they're doing, if you like. If we're going to think things about supporting students, Michael, I think you're quite right. It, it involves us thinking again about what admissions mean. So you connect our mission closer to academic delivery. So we do think about this being a process, not just a process that starts earlier, as we discussed today, but also finishes later. So actually, you know, we, we, when we're into year one, that is seen as part of their mission process in a way because it's supporting students, not just for you, we all have HE, but in connecting it to this question of our mission, then I think that's a really important question. And um, I think, you know, again, you know, PQA and thinking about structures of academic years, that's where you can start thinking about how you structure and support an academic year in year one for the academic year, of year one to be more geared towards supporting students, in particular those students we spoke about today. So I think there are opportunities of, of, of bringing these agendas together. Certainly, I think we tried to attempt that a little bit in the paper next week and in the previous one. I tried to. I'll hand over to you. Lee, over to you. Really good. Good points, Michael. I mean, my partner, she's, she's Irish and in Ireland, they have a year out and most kids will take a year out of, of school to get work experience or, or do you know volunteer and I've always been interested in that I, you know, in many ways Michael I wonder whether actually you know I've been thinking could we could we actually have an extra year here you know the, the, the young people in this country and I, I mean the whole of the UK here 
I still think that they are on a kind of rat race in the, in the school system where, you know, actually, there's, to be honest, a, a lot of them aren't experiencing uh, things outside the, 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 the sort of testing to the, you know, uh, system that we have we we developed. So I did wonder actually where this is this would be more radical to PQA where we actually introduced introduce another year. Now it'd probably be costs associated with that. Um, but you know I do I do wonder whether that could be I know Ireland's a smaller country, but maybe we could look at countries like that to sort of see, you know, whether we could be more radical on, on these sorts of issues. I, I hope that this time we're in, these difficult times we're in that we can consider some of these radical things I think personally with two young teenagers myself I'd love them to get some experience maybe before they then went went to university um, and by the way one final point I'll hand it over to you because of time but remember with all these debates remember we've got to remember also apprenticeships and you know when when I was I was thinking you know when we were talking about Chloe about choice it, you know it's not one university against the other it's also whether young people should be thinking about um earning while they're learning you know those routes and I, and I think sorry I know it's not about PQA but if we could look at the bigger issues I think there is an issue around the half of people that don't go to university which we, which we probably need to help even more out but anyway I, I won't go on a rant about that I'll hand back to you Vic. Thank you very much. Um, and, and we are being uh, beaten by time in a situation where I feel like we could probably talk about these issues all day. Uh, and in fact, I've just said to Jenny, I feel like we could run three conferences on the topics that we are talking about, at, at least. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is just sum up from this event um, and to give you a couple of reminders about things that it, to look out for in the next week or so. Um, so first of all, it falls to me to say thank you very, very much to our two panel members, to Graham and to Lee for spending this time with us. Um, it, we really appreciate it. And it's been a really interesting, fantastic conversation. I want to say thank you as well to the staff that have helped to put on this event, um, including Jenny and Sue, who have been working so hard in the background of this event. I also want to say hello and shout out thank you to Angela Nati, whose name you will have heard when Graham was speaking earlier, and I've just seen this in the event with us today, Angela's done a huge amount of work in this area. So thanks to you as well, Angela. Um, and thank you to everyone who's attended um, and to those of you who've had questions. And we'd like to keep these conversations going. Now, you may have seen, I'm going to just pop into the chat just in case you haven't. Um, we're talking about radical reimagining of the admission system, and we are very much talking about post-qualification admissions as part of a bigger picture. And certainly the ideas that we've touched on today around gateway and, and sort of opportunity for further thinking, further imaginative reform, perhaps even the work that UCU is doing around the need for qualification reform and reform around exams is relevant here. Um, we yesterday put out our response to a UCAS piece on admissions, which while we welcome it, we don't feel is radical enough. Um, so I've put a link to that for you to have a look at. Um, and next week, there will be a report being released, the one that um, you've had a sneak preview of basically today through Graham's presentation. So you've all had kind of early doors access to that content, but it will be published next week. So please look out for that in UCU announcements and please keep the conversation up with us. If you're tweeting about this event, um, please tag the UCU account at UCU. Please email us if you want to carry on the conversations. UCU does have an education committee which meets a number of times every year and which kind of looks after the, the direction that policy is going and how we're implementing it in this area. Um, there are so many more things we can do. It's been so brilliant to have you all with us. Um, so again, just thank you very, very much to everyone for participating and we hope to see you again soon.